the meeting at this time and uh, reconvene the meeting. Pledge uh, of Allegiance. Uh, Kevin, can you lead us in both pledges, please? Sure. Roll 
Paul Jones. Mr. Shaw? Yes. Mr. Morrison? Yes. Ms. Magnolito? Yes. Mr. Mitchell? Yes. Mr. Long? Yes. Thank you. Now, we adjourn the uh, meeting. This is uh, the reconvening meeting that we're adjourning. So, motion? A motion to adjourn. Motion. Motion's been made. Roll call. John? Mr. Shaw? Yes. Mr. Morrison? Yes. Ms. Magnolito? Yes. Mr. Mitchell? Yes. Mr. Long? Yes. 537. Thank you. Now we go to our agenda for our meeting this evening. We've done the call to order, pledge of allegiance, uh, approval of the agenda. I make a motion that we yes, approve the agenda. Wait, 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 wait. The call to order again, I guess, for the regular meeting, it's uh, 5, 5.37. Roll call. John? Charles Long. Present. Kevin Mitchell. Here. Priscilla Magnolito. Present. Chris Winson. Here. Michael Shaw. Here. Okay, we do have a quorum. Approval of the agenda. I make a motion that we approve the agenda. For the regular meeting? Yes. Okay. Motions in the May. Roll call. John? Mr. Shaw? Yes. Mr. Morrison? Yes. Ms. Magnolito? Yes. Mr. Mitchell? Yes. Mr. Long? Yes. Can we approve our agenda for the meeting this evening? Present Long, we have one in Board of Education. We have one recognition this evening. Uh, Giovanna Hanks will be presenting that. This evening, with more than 25 years of service with Gallatin Hill County Schools, I've been educator, principal, and superintendent of our district. Frank Chipetti um, is receiving his retirement of work from Gallatin Hill County Schools.
you have the information in your packet. Please. One, one comment I want to make um, under the, uh, the bid for aggregate materials. It has Michelle's ready mix talk, but it doesn't have it as a New Mexico resident or resident. Um, Michelle uh, Bonavidi is the former Michelle ready mix contract, uh, ready mix rock. And she is a New Mexico resident. She, she is? She is. Okay. She is. New Mexico resident. I just want to make that Thank you, Michael. Mr. Long, members of the board, Superintendent Hyatt, um, you actually have to apply for a specific certification, and the only way that procurement is able to count that is if the company has actually received that certification from the state. It's just a regulatory practice. Jawan, one more question, please. So, the total percentage, are you going by percentages? Because it's all zeros, and then, or am I not reading it right? And I apologize, is this on the aggregate materials? Do you need me to come look? Yes, please. please. Thank you very much. And then I called the school back 
and the principal is no longer there. She has been transferred. So they have a new principal coming in. So I'm like, okay, so we have a new principal coming in. The holidays right around the corner, we're going on a break. We're not going to be back till Wednesday. My daughter won't be back in school until Thursday. So I said, okay, we're not going to be back until Thursday. I will talk to him then. I was here Wednesday afternoon. I was informed by Shannon that our new principal wouldn't even be at the school until Friday. So I said, okay, I sent my daughter to school. And then Friday, I went and talked to the principal. When she came home, I tried to get the bleeding to stop. It's about a half an inch cut on her head. I couldn't get it to stop, no matter how much pressure I put on it. I had to take her to the emergency room. She got two staples in her head, three staples, I'm sorry, in her head from that injury. Back to Friday, I went and talked to the principal. The principal leans back in his seat and says, nothing happened to your daughter, nobody did nothing. I said, okay. So some mystical powers came and grabbed her on the shoulder and pushed her in the aisle on the bus. He goes, I guess so. And then when I called the bus barn and asked them what they saw, they said they really couldn't see anything because the camera is not really that clear. It's kind of blurry when they see, look at things. And I told them, I can understand that. And I can understand that this, the camera probably will not pick it up because these are little children. These are elementary kids. My seven-year-old is only gay high. So when she sits in the seat, you can't see her. You can probably see the top of her head. And that's the reason why I'm here. Is that the normal procedure or the normal thing that's said when a child gets hurt on the bus? The school told me that transportation will take care of, that the transportation told me that the school will discipline the child. I went in and I asked, what's going on with this child? Is anything going to happen? No, because she did nothing to your child. So I said, okay, so now what do I do? He says, I don't know. That next day when she went to school, when I sent her back to school, that same child came up to her and hit her on the head where her staples were. And she said, ow! And nobody responded. And I'm sure she didn't tell the teacher. And she came home and she was crying. She says, my head hurts on Thursday. And I said, why? And she told me, that girl, I told her to leave me alone. She's not one of my regular friends. And I told her to leave me alone, but when I turned my back, she hit my head. And now my head hurts. So if this is what's going on with your transportation, and this is what's going on with the parents whose students get hurt on the bus, that doesn't work. Something needs to be done. These are little children. I'm sure you wouldn't appreciate it if your kids got hurt like that, if your student or your child got hurt like that. But when it comes to, I hate to say it, us Native Americans, it's pushed under the rug. Something needs to happen. Something needs to be done. We're 85 at least percent of the students in this district, if not 90. But yet, when it comes to us, Native Americans, our skin is brown, yes. That's God's blessing. Something happened, something has to be done about this. I want something done. I want something happening at the school where this child is recommended for her actions. Because to what I understood, that's where it lies school, not at the transportation department, not at the bus department, but at the school because it happened on the bus. Thank you. Question Cash Mom. Next we go to Gabby and Andrea. Thomas. Good evening superintendent, school board members, audience. Um, first, I'd like to request, I'm going to go over three minutes, so I want at least five minutes. Um, first of all, I would like to thank uh, Superintendent Mike Hyatt and your administration for the upgrade in um, the, I guess, meals 
for the athletes and the whole town and also special uh, special thank you for the bleachers that are going to be installed at Tohachi High School. Thank you very much for that. Uh, second item going down the agenda um, going to the uh, what is it open meeting on D seven D. Um, you know, I came here to um, got uh, was informed that the meeting was at five thirty. You know, you you have to think about us working parents. Um, I remember two meetings ago it was stated that um, there was going to be a look at the, uh, the change in time, and it was for you school board members' safety. Why is it just your safety? Why isn't it us two as parents that work? I get off at 4.30 and I'm a one that will not leave my office any earlier. By the time I leave my work, get on the road, it's 4.40. And I had to race over here, I had to speed. And that's not safe. So I don't think that you need to look at that and reconsider that. And it always can't be about you guys. It has to be about parents too. That's why your students are here. That's why you're sitting up there. Uh, the next thing is, um, I guess, the uh, re-election. I see on here on 7A. I just want to say that we did have a former president who did receive state awards. And I'm sure that stood for something. And it wasn't just given to her. She was a very great leader. She spoke for us. She spoke for Gallup McKinley County Schools. She was prepared at these meetings. And that's what we need as a leader. You talked about the younger generation coming up, taking your places and stuff. And that's what we need. So I want that to be considered in your, um, I guess, as far as looking at that. And then I want to thank the audience and the parents who are regulars here. Thank you for being here. And I'm sorry that has happened to your granddaughter. And I hope it, something gets done. And again, thank you, administration, Mr. Chavez. And for the uh, athletes upgrade and our teachers. Thank you very much. Joe, you're next. Good evening. I didn't know you changed the time on me. I apologize, but I'm going to come around and shake everybody's hand right now because I miss you guys. Mission, and uh, I'm very sorry I missed that. 
I also want to speak about the Henderson case as the main thing. Mr. Hyde, if you get with me sometime on your appointment. Uh, I'm aware of what the Henderson case consists of, and the new board members, maybe not, but I'd like to keep in touch. I appreciate it. And one more thing, I think when the Zuni uh, school district exited from the Gabby High schools, they have the right idea. Thank you. Thank you. And we go to the next agenda item, superintendent's report. Thank you, President Long. Board of Education. I'm just going to spend a couple minutes talking about some of the activities that are happening or things we're getting ready for for the new school year. Uh, it's fast. It's, somebody said it's coming up a little over a month. Actually, it's uh, less than one day than, than a month. So it's coming up on us quickly. I also had somebody mention, uh, not part of the school system, but asked if we're getting starting to get ready for the new school year. And I told them we started that months ago. Uh, there's been a lot of planning in place, a lot of group thinking of different ways of doing things, and so we've made a few changes this coming school year, and we are very excited. We've pumped a lot of money into PR to let parents know of what's happening. Um, we're doing a better job at putting out press releases, putting out information to the chapters. Uh, we have a listserv, we're putting all these people, these entities on, so we can pump out information to the community as fast as possible. Uh, not everybody listens to board meetings. And so this is a fast way for us to get information out of the community, and also through Facebook and other means. Uh, one of the things that we're keeping our minds focused on is instruction, and our instructional leaders, and the instruction that happens in classrooms for this next school year. And sometimes uh, school districts and schools and people, in especially administrative positions, get caught up sometimes in the managerial pieces of what it takes to run the school and a district. And we need to refocus and make sure that we're predominantly focused on instruction and that's one of the drivers of our thinking this year and this doesn't just mean math and reading this means all areas of instruction for our school district whether it's uh, language and culture math reading science social studies electives and looking for new opportunities for those areas that may not get, get as much attention uh, as other as others do and so we've made some structural changes in central office We've increased a little bit uh, some of our dean positions at school sites. That way our principals can spend more time uh, working with the staff on instruction and not get caught up so much in the, in the weeds of uh, some of the managerial duties. Also made some changes this year, uh, hopefully tonight. Actually, it was on the consent agenda, so I guess it is approved. That's a new instruction, our new assessment platform for our district, which is really tied straight to uh, what students will see on the part exam. So the students are seeing the exact same types of questions in the exact same format uh, on the computer that they'll see on the state assessments. And we feel that will help our students uh, be more ready for, for those types of assessments in the, in the spring. Now the last thing I wanted to mention, and actually I want to mention a few things that are coming up that you'll notice on the notices of communication. Uh, not only am I saying this, but we plan a lot of activities this month in preparing our principals uh, for the changes this coming school year. So for the last two days, including tomorrow, our principals are involved in the Structural Leadership uh, Conference here at Central Office, and geared towards uh, these new initiatives that we're, we're enacting. Uh, and, and actually more so than the initiative, more of the expectations on them and what we're expecting from our school site leaders. Uh, also on the 13th, uh, we have a new administrator training. You're welcome to attend this for any administrator, but also new administrators and getting them ready for the school year. We have six new principals, uh, few new assistant principals, and today actually we hired four new teams. So we're trying to get everybody ready again. So the next thing is on the 18th, we have administrator training for all administrators in the district. August 4th, and then we start working with teachers. And on the 7th is when for the new teachers, the rest of the teachers show up on the 7th, and the school starts on the 9th. Uh, so we're excited for the activities this month, but also excited for the training opportunities for our staff throughout the school year. The last thing I want to mention uh, before we go to the next item is there's been some a lot of questions regarding transportation and the uh, new house, the new house bill, Senate Bill 382, uh, with regards to suburbans. And so we have received information from the state of when we can purchase those. And the information we found out is we're going to have to wait uh, until the state puts out more information. And they use the, the, the month of December 2017. 
but we're going to keep pushing uh, to get information. Uh, we would like to get suburban sooner than later and not wait till then and know how many that we can purchase and get our routes together so that we can have those suburbans up and going to get our students across the bridges in the county. And with that, uh, board president, members of the board, uh, include my comments. Questions, comments, board members? I guess, um, Mr. President, um, I just want to say that, you know, I think that um, the joint um, superintendent and his administration has done a great job as far as um, PR. You know, I think that um, there's quite a bit out there informing parents, community members of happenings that are going on um, within the district. And I really appreciate that. Thank you. Sure. Comments, Priscilla? Um, Yante, thank you all for being here um, this evening um, to our board meeting. Um, Mr. Hiddeman, um, former board member of GAHAD, thank you for being here this evening. Um, and everybody else that um, came out to attend our meeting, Mr. Manini, um, so nice to see you, sir, also. I just wanted to say, um, kind of the same long line that Mr. Mitchell um, has commented, I've been in and out um, here and also um, I'd like to say thank you for administration for the starting of the two, next school year. Um, there's a lot happening. I stopped by the other day and there was some training for um, when I when I stopped by in here in the boardroom. But I think um, with this new year, I think that is going to be a positive um, year for our children. There's a lot of wonderful changes. I stopped in to talk to. Um, Mr. Chavez also, and even when we had the, the Redskin um, football camp here, and seeing all the kids, um, I'll touch more on that, but I just want to say thank you. Um, and thank you, Mr. Hyatt, for the board reports. Um, I, I appreciate the time that you take to give us updates um, on what's happening within our district. So thank you very much for that. And question-wise, I think um, with the transportation, um, is there any hints or anything that they're giving us on the delay? Why or is it? Are they giving you any reason why they're waiting? I can provide more information to the information we received directly in writing from the state. Um, but I think what's happened is there's just been some change and there's been some direction that they need to receive. There's a lot, there's, lately there's been a lot of change over at the PD level. And so I think people are swamped. Um, that possibly part of it. Uh, and so some of, some of the direction is not coming as fast as we'd like. And I think that sometimes that happens with laws when they change. The, the law may change, but it takes time to enact it. And so and, and to get the requirements behind in the form of rules from PED. And so, like I said, we're going to still keep advocating because we need uh, we need these suburbans for our students to get to school safely, timely, and uh, more efficiently. And so we're going to keep pushing for that information, and as soon as we feel comfortable in purchasing those suburbans, we will, and add the necessary items or follow a special protocol that may be, that they may be given to us in December. Um, but we'll get, we're going to advocate for sooner than and, and the reason why I say is because I know it was reported a couple of times during our board meetings from parents in that area that have said, you know, we lost students to um, the BIE schools uh, due to the, for us not being able to accommodate the kids. And I, you know, I was really hoping that maybe with the new year we would be able to start, um, start that transportation services for our students. And maybe our enrollment would start to go back up in that area so but I, I know that even just um, them and uh, on Johnson Road is a big plus for our district so I know that would help our enrollment also anybody else Christian thank you superintendent for your report uh, we go down to board report board member any report I have nothing Any else? Points? 
board member. Um, I, I just, I was a bit under the weather, so I finally, um, I attended the, um, my local Theru chapter planning meeting yesterday, and I did send out an invitation um, and a request to Yamato chapter for um, myself and Mr. Hyatt to attend the chapter meeting on July 19th. And then also our regular third chapter meeting is going to be on the 30th. And he's also on the agenda, we're both on the agenda for our reports on that time. Um, sir, that's all I have to report at this time. Okay, thank you. I'll report something. I, uh, yes. I was the, the lone school board representative at my high school reunion <laughs> last weekend. <laughs> It was a great party. <laughs> I made sure, and no, it was nice to see everybody. It's been uh, it's been a while, you know, with a lot of those folks. And, you know, I don't know, that's the only thing. I wasn't there in an official capacity, but it was certainly a school function. Okay. That it for board reports. Let's go forward then. Uh, you can read the notices and communications on your own. But this coming Thursday, up to Saturday, myself, Kevin Mitchell, and Priscilla Manlito will be going out to Hong Kong uh, for leadership uh, conference. They said they, they say retreat, and I would say we never retreat, but I always go forward. So, Sorry, sir. I just remembered one more. I put it right here so I wouldn't forget and I still forgot. Um, with the New Mexico School Board Association uh, for Region 1, um, we selected a young lady. Um, she will be the 2017 scholarship recipient. Her name is Anna Lisa Costner uh, from Cent uh, Kirtland Central. And I will be presenting her with her award on July 18th for the Central School um, School Board meeting and at 3.30 on the 18th. So I just wanted to let everybody know that we did make a selection for our region, which is Region 1. Thank you for that information. Um, let's go down to item 4 under reports. Sure. Athletics. Mr. President, um, President Long, Board of Education, tonight, this has been a long time coming. Um, it's probably one every year that we've talked about updating handbooks and things for athletics and activities. And it's one of those items that we've kind of put on the back burner at times because, again, we're focused on instruction, but we were able to schedule over the time this summer to make some changes. And these aren't policy changes. These are handbook and guideline changes underneath our board policy. And these are items that some needed changes and some needed clarity for our sponsors that, and our athletes and our parents with regards to the extracurricular activities. And so I have invited uh, Mr. Chavez, our athletic activities director for the school district, to kind of put a list together of some of the major, uh, we might say, changes. There's been a lot of little things that are changed within this handbook, and more is to come with respect to fundraising, which is another big thing that we tackle. We just got to finalize a few things, and I'll, I'll give the report, have a report for you later on uh, in, in August. So I'll turn the time over to Mr. Chavez to give his, his report. Thank you. Uh, President Long, members of the board, uh, Superintendent Hyatt, uh, again, thank you for allowing us to, or allowing me to be the voice for athletic directors, coaches, uh, and most of all, the athletes of all the Alameda County kind of schools. We do, and I will continue to always um, support extracurricular activities and sports because um, they do play a major role in the lives of, of all the, the youth development in the county schools. Uh, tonight I just wanted to go over some of the, the key cha with changes, but I consider them improvements on uh, myself, uh, things that we've been able to work together on Mr. Hyatt and uh, Mr. Barn um, in meeting with uh, lots of community members and, and talking with athletes, just some of the things that we could be improved upon for athletics and, and uh, so we'll just start with the top uh, with the handbook 
Uh, the biggest change in the handbook that we have made this year is uh, we've gone back to the NMAA standard of open enrollment for 8th and 9th graders. We're no longer going to mandate where a student has to enroll as long as they've got a, a district approved that academic transfer. They will be allowed to establish their enrollment for participation in the high school of their choice. Um, we have uh, updated and made <clears throat> more specifics to our coaches code of conduct and this is uh, directly to try to make sure that the athletes are protected and the coaches understand exactly all their responsibilities and, and uh, is there a copy of the code of conduct in there? I just, I just wanted to go back to the first one on your open enrollment for the high school eligibility. Is that the one that we were discussing where if they're going to be transferring from the to Hatchie, um, they had to wait out a quarter or a semester or? Yes. Which one was it? A quarter? It was a, it was a semester. The old policy a semester. Was a semester. So basically what we're doing is going back to the NMAA state regulation, which is eighth or ninth graders can attend any high school of their choice as long as they have an approved academic transfer. And we don't want to call them restrictions or punishments, but those things would only occur after a student has established their residency and decides to transfer to another school. In other words, they keep students from playing basketball at uh, Toachi High and then transferring to Miami or play baseball because they have a bit of better team. So we just wanted to make that more open and um, go back to state. Mr. Chavez, Mr. Yes. Tangolito, I just want to add one thing. That's that's if there's room in that school. If you have a school that's maxed out with those students that are in that attendance area, then that will hinder whether a student. Now that doesn't happen very often, but that hinders whether a student is able to transfer to that school. Is that how, is that how it's stated in? It is, and all the handbook. I'm sorry. Yes. Yeah, the transfer form. Yeah, thank you. An improved academic transfer form, which of course that's the first thing you check is, is enrollment numbers. Um, so coming from Gallup, maybe they can choose to go to Gallup Mike or Maya Mira without any um, automatic. Correct. Yeah. Right. Yes. Again, I'm just going to add just to make sure everybody's clear on that because I don't want any confusion in the community. Uh, but that again is based off availability of positions for students to attend school there. And we try to do that as soon as possible. We're starting to notice a trend of where we're having openings and where we're not. And so there's a few schools we're going to have to lock down for a period of time until we, we see how many students attend at the start of the school year. But most schools we're able to see whether there's an opening or not or going to be openings or not. So. Right. And along those measures, uh, parents do still have to follow through the NMA requirement. Um, paperwork, which means if you're a student out of your district, you signed a waiver saying that you're responsible for your own transportation, the district won't provide busing and those type of things. So the academic portion is always first, but we thought it would be better to go back to uh, state regulations rather than having our own above and beyond. So that, that was uh, one of the changes. Uh, back to the coaches code of conduct again, it's just outlining some specifics that we expect and it's a uh, uh, tool that we want to use to make sure that coaches are held accountable um, and looking after all the student athletes, their programs, making sure that everything is is uh, most beneficial to the athletes themselves. There was some cases where uh, coaches did some things that ended up ultimately hurting the student athletes, and that's everything from their budgets to state competition, all kinds of stuff. But we just want to make sure that we're telling them. Remember, number first and foremost, you want to make sure that the students and the student athletes benefit the most from everything you're doing as a coach, so we're kind of detailing uh, what their expectations are, and that's what the coach's code of conduct is. Um, within the handbook, we have uh, clarified our expectations as far as individual schools and their athletic directors, and how they need to make sure that the parents are notified and informed of, of all things, so we have mandated that um, each school have their own handbook, and in those, the parent meetings are our big expectation. We've, we've outlined what we expect individual schools to do as far as getting information out to parents. So those uh, mandatory meetings will be obviously uh, fall, winter, and spring. 
Uh, we've also uh, mandated that each school come up with their own um, student slash athlete activities handbook that's given out to the parents with a signature page. That way, uh, parents do get all the information up front. And that details everything from when the appropriate time to talk to coaches is and uh, what the expectations are as a parent as well. So we just want to make it easier for the communication lines and the transparency between parents, coaches, and administration can, can be there. Um, <clears throat> um, we have clarified that there should be no practice, there will be no practices on Sundays, and we cannot, or they will no longer be allowed to have mandatory athletic practices on Saturdays. And uh, this is, again, not only for uh, personal reasons for individuals, but also for families. It, it's hard for parents to, a lot of times, get their students to, to practice on Saturdays, and uh, definitely not on Sundays for, for individual reasons. So we just wanted to make sure that that was clarified in the hand, so coaches would not use that or hold that against the athletes. Okay. That was my question was, if they do not attend practice, will that penalize them for not playing a game or no, and that's why we wanted to put this specifically in the writing. Now, that's not saying that uh, they, they couldn't hold a practice on a Saturday, but we're just saying it's not mandatory. They cannot hold that against the student athlete. And that was the intent to make sure that the, the athletes and the families uh, benefit from coaches trying to go overboard and <laughs> holding you know, six hour practices on a Saturday. Um, we'll touch on some other stuff about specifics for practice towards the end. Um, the next thing is that uh, we put it in writing that coaches cannot mandate that athletes receive or have to pay for any outside services such as speed training or tumbling. Uh, there, we, we did find that there were situations where coaches were requiring the athletes to get outside training which the parents had to pay for. For example, uh, track coaches telling athletes you have to go sign up with the speed training downtown. And that, would, that was a, a cost that parents were having to, to you know, come up with. We wanted to make sure that was all eliminated. So uh, that is in black and white now. Coaches, athletic directors, principals will understand that we will not mandate that any coach require any type of outside um, services that would uh, benefit the athlete or their team. So again, little things like that that we're putting in, into the handbook that, that uh, hopefully is beneficial most of all for the student athletes, but also for the parents. Um, and going down the wheels, you've already, most of you know about that, uh, some of the major changes, and I think the, the biggest cheer and, and uh, applaud that we got was from the athletes themselves. We are no longer requiring, and here's your, your support on this, the sack lunches on trips. Um, not saying that they won't still be available, that service will be available if there are teams that will be going say, on a track meet uh, to a, you know, a, one of the far off schools that they're going to be leaving at 4 in the morning. And it's a service that will still be available, but it will not be mandatory anymore. We're not going to send our students with the same sack lunch every trip, every game, all season long. Mr. Um, Travis, I really would like to say, I don't want to burst Mr. Hyatt's bubble here, but I really would like to say thank you to the students and the athletes themselves that were that took that initiative to inform board members, to inform coaches, to inform the superintendent directly, and even speak to, to us publicly um, about the issues that they were having um, with, with their meals during um, away games. And I think that shows that we do have are some strong leaders within our youth that are willing to voice their concerns about something that they do not feel comfortable or they feel that it's not right as a student to not get quality um, meals during their during their games and they even sent us pictures text pictures um, picture text to us and I just want to give them a big shout out for Thank you for um, letting the board and administration know that you were not satisfied. So, thank you so much. Agreed. Uh, we also increased the price per meal that student athletes will, will, will get, and uh, that's another plus. I mean, as we all know, things are getting more expensive.
that can target it even on a dollar spin for, for a low amount. So by increasing the amount to eight dollars per meal uh, gives the coaches and the athletes more options, uh, but more flexibility. So that should make things easier, and uh, again, a great benefit to the student athletes. The last one is lodging. We did have some situations where student athletes and parents uh, had a lot of complaints that came into the office about the lodging that, that we were able to provide for them. So uh, we did increase the amount per athlete uh, that they will get for lodging for overnight trips, and that should eliminate a lot of the issues, um, plus the safety of, of our student athletes. Uh, they'll be able to stay in nicer establishments. So that's Let me interject a little bit here, Mr. Chavez. This is not just for athletes, it's for all students. So it could be a trip for whatever, and they would still get the same opportunity. So I just want to make sure that's clear. Thanks, sir. Um, number three, coaching licensure. Uh, I've got a lot of people that come up to me even in Walmart and say, Mr. Chavis, well, how do I become a coach? You know, And uh, I think it's something that maybe was just overlooked. There's always been policies and procedures and, and handouts that were there, but we thought we'd make it easier. So we worked with personnel uh, directly to come up with a coaching licensure walkthrough and checklist. And it's basically, uh, you can see the handout there, it should be able to answer and guide someone through the process of how to become a coach, how to get licensed in the state of New Mexico, and how to continue that licensure. So um, just another small thing that we wanted to add in there. Hopefully it uh, will help us to get a lot more coaches for all of young people in schools because we, we have been kind of in a coaching drought, and we, there's people out there that want to assist and help, so hopefully this is this is going to make it a little bit easier for them to, to become sort of white. Um, Mr. Hyatt talked about uh, we are in the final stages of coming up with a, a manual that we're going to be able to give out to individual schools about fundraising, um, any type of uh, outside organizations that want to assist and uh, not donate, but uh, help our student athletes out. And so uh, we're, we're coming under the manual. Some of the things that we're going to address in that uh, are things like uh, donations, which obviously have to be important, fundraising for schools, uh, charitable stuff, and, and how to properly have an organization booster club, but we want to call them financial organizations that benefit individual schools. Um, so that handbook will, will be hopefully finished shortly and we'll be able to present it to you all. And some of the things that uh, we want to try to make sure is that uh, the people in the community understand that we are not trying to tell parents you cannot help fundraise. We want to give them a guide to make sure that they understand how to do it correctly and that way everyone benefits and there's no one, no one held back. And that's going to be something for all the schools, especially the rural schools. Uh, Manu Lito and I talked a lot about uh, some of the rural schools and how, how they may not have as many opportunities, uh, but we want to make sure that those opportunities are there and that there's a, a, a guideline for them to use on how to make sure that that's done properly so that all students benefit and all schools benefit. Um, number six, GMCS, we are on our third year of the uniform rotation that was created, and I think this has been a big, big help to all the schools of government to make, to make sure that all of our student athletes, uh, number one, look good, but number two, that they're safe, that they're in the NMA required and the, N the New Mexico High School Association required uniforms, safety equipment, and everything else that they need. Um, I just got a call from Crown Point High School that uh, they were missing a lot of their football uniforms. And I was, you know, I had to go back and look and say, well, Three years ago, you were on the start of uh, the uniform rotation, so uh, we had to we have to have a meeting to see what we can do to try to help those student athletes out. But the reason that we established it is to make sure that again the accountability is there. And um, one of the things in the coaches' code of conduct is inventory and making sure that coaches understand you have to be held accountable for these type of things. So by establishing all these little things in uniform rotation, the budget, uh, the, the coaches' code of conduct. Our, our ultimate goal is to, again, make sure that student athletes are not the ones that suffer. So um, I think the uniform rotation has been a big, big plus. Um, 
again, we have allocated. And Mr. Chavez, and the, year, the number of years rotation is, is it seven still? Four. Oh, it's four. So if I'm four basketball years. or football or whatever, every I'm going to get every four years, I'm going to get every year. Every four years, your varsity team will get a new set of uniforms. Okay. Any questions on the uniforms? Okay. Okay. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. So again, uh, we have good. Yes, yes, yes. When we were talking about this, you said that but the school has funding if they want to use some of their operational or there's funding to buy additional uniforms that may maybe some like what you just said, their uniforms were lost or they need a bigger size, that they have money at their own school site to purchase like a uniform, one uniform or a bigger size. Yes, ma'am. Okay. So the district will we just make sure that each uh, on the rotation every four years the varsity team does get a new set of uniforms. Now that doesn't include anything that's not mandatory or required to be an official NMA you know, participant. Uh, in other words, we, we can't buy shoes, uh, individual equipment like brackets, jackets, sweats, um, coaches gear, those type of things. And that's just to make sure that all the funds that we have is going directly to the athlete. And yes, to answer your question, we do make funds available to individual schools from Galton County County Schools, and that is uh, through the operational and through the gate receipts. We do make sure that schools are given funds, and this is every sport, um, every activity as well, including band, which we go above and beyond to try to help uh, fund to make sure that those, those students do have some money set aside to try to get as many things as they can. So we don't have quite enough to make, to get everyone everything that they want, but uh, we do what we can to make sure that we give them the best opportunity to, to be able to um, we did come up with a handout that we're going to give athletic directors, coaches, and bookkeepers. And this is, again, to try to eliminate some of the problems that we've had over the last couple of years with everything from the accounting of money to um, how to properly go about making sure that, again, the student athletes are not affected because there was negligence at any part from the athletic director down to the ticket taker. So these expectations have been uh, created, and hopefully it'll, it'll be a guide for for uh, all the people in this process to, to make sure that everything goes smoothly and the money does come directly back to benefit the student athletes. Um, and finally, in the handbook, uh, as you get towards the end in the appendices, you will see that uh, the handouts that we have, well, that have always been in, in, in uh, the handbook have been updated to reflect some of the changes that we have made. And um, all these changes will reflect some of the, the new ideas that we talked about in, in the improvements or changes to the athletic handbook. And um, all this stuff will be available for parents and everyone else on the Gallatin County County School website under athletics. And if there's any questions, ever any questions, anyone knows they can come by visit me or call me anytime. Okay. There's one more question. Ms. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I have a whole list. Ready? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Is does anywhere in our athletic handbook um, or um, within your training that you're going to be doing for um, athletic directors and coaches, do you express the our policy against energy drinks? Yes, ma'am. Since that is now school board policy in the official uh, discipline handbook, and there are uh, you know, repercussions or punishments for students that do get caught with that, it is uh, first thing we see in, in, in all of our meetings is that student athletes are subject to all Galveston County, County Schools discipline rules and policies. So yes, they would fall right in, into that, and we do. Obviously, stress that with with uh, coaches and in those meetings, the importance of nutrition, health, all those things. And yeah, to answer your question, yes, that's a big thing that we can do. Thank you. And then with the the policy and procedures, I know that you're going to be uh, the parents would have to do a mandatory meeting 
to um, review this with the principal and athletic director and coaches. But for the, from the beginning, do you, re, because this is some new, some new things that have changed in here, and I should say thank you, first of all, also, that I appreciate this review and this update, because we've been asking for this, too, um, for a couple of years now, and it's done, and I just thank you very much for that. But will, will you be doing the same thing with the 80s and the coaches to review this handbook, like, beginning of the school year? Yes, ma'am, absolutely. What we'll be doing is, uh, first we'll start with the administrators at the uh, principal's trainings that we have coming up in, within, you know, before the beginning of school. We will go over all these policies and some of the expectations and the changes with the administration. I will then go on to take it further to the athletic directors and uh, my goal this year is to actually go out to the schools and attend as many of the winter, spring, and fall mandatory meetings that I can to answer any questions that they have there. I think the biggest thing is the um, last year I did require that all schools come up with their own handbook that they give out to student athletes. And one of the requirements was that the last page of the handout has to be a code of conduct that's signed between the student athlete and the parent. So after the rules meeting, the parents actually have to go sign off that they receive a copy of all the rules, all the changes, all the expectations, and give that back so it's on file. What that does is, is not only help us out as an administration, uh, when a problem comes up where, let's say, a, a, a basketball player didn't get playing time and the parent came down out of the stands and, and started a, a fight with, with the coach, when it does eventually come to us, which it will get to the school board about the complaints, we'll go back and say, no, we discussed this one, the appropriate time to talk to coaches is, and so on. So hopefully just having some of those preventative measures in place and getting those signatures from that code of conduct that the parents have to sign will prevent a lot of the problems from getting up. So if a coach does not sign the coach's conduct, or if a parent does not sign, the code of conduct, when, so they won't be able to participate as a coach or as an athlete. For the coach, we'll say yes, because we, that is a, a paid position that the district does have, have control over. For the parents, we want to make it more of a, that transparency that we always talked about. And explaining up front, our, these are, are some of the expectations we have for you as a parent. But in return, we're telling you all the expectations that we have from our coaches and from the administration. So it, it, it's a good deal. When I, when I add, though, they do have to sign a contract which includes that they understand the handbook. And so that is a requirement to participate, along with the concussion training and other things. And that was just a question that I received from a parent about the um, contract of the coaches, which is not contract, but with the code of conduct. And they wanted to know if that was something that we we hold them accountable to. Um, so that was one of their questions. Yes. Okay. By having that code of conduct that was created now that the coaches will sign off on, uh, that will be the shaking of hands between, between them and us saying that they understand that they're in this with the student athletes and not with themselves. And our ultimate goal is to make sure that we take the picture away from me mainly as a coach of any doing this. What's benefiting our students and our community? And the last question I received was, um, when will the game, the scheduled games be completed? And, the, and, and there was an issue that I brought to um, Mr. Hyatt earlier about um, there was games, and he answered it pretty good, but I think um, um, just for the transparency part of it, uh, the schedules for the games for football and basketball, they should be almost completed now? Yes, ma'am. So we, there was a requirement, and of course with the change in administration, it's difficult, um, especially for schools that have, had, uh, have not had an athletic director or principal for a certain amount of time. We have mandated that all schools turn in their schedules to us. We've created a specific guideline that will go out this year, but uh, for the most part, they do have all the fall schedules for all of the Alton County County schools. High school, of course, mid school will, will be to come, but uh, yes, that was a requirement that they had to turn those in to me. And 
we did last year mandate that schools have these schedules updated and posted on their individual school web pages. I know that that was somewhat neglected, but that's one of the requirements that we're going to make sure we follow through with this year. That way the parents will always have access to, to the schedule of their local schools and athletic events. Thank you. And my last question is, so Mr. Hyatt, we resolved that that parents that sit at practice don't eat that. Correct. Okay. That's it. Thank you. Thank you all very much for your Okay. We don't have any old business, so we go into new business. The first um, item under new business is the election of Board of Education officers. And at this point, I'd like to open nomination for the board presidency. Mr. President, I would like to nominate Charles Long for president. Okay. Um, Mr. President, um, yes. I would like to nominate um, Priscilla Manuelito as president of the board. Um, as I stated the last time, um, she has shown that she is more than capable of handling this position. Um, when she was the president, you know, I would receive, and I'm sure the rest of the board used to receive updates from her that she would get from the superintendent or from the attorneys or anybody else. Um, at this point, I have yet to receive any updates from, um, from the past month and a half here on anything that's going on or any information that's going on between the president and the superintendent or anybody else. Um, I really feel that you know, she has received um, state recognition. And like um, one of our parents said earlier, you know, that is something that she has earned and not just given. Um, I honestly feel that you know, she was one of the best presidents that we've had. And I would like to nominate her and have her continue in that status. Thank you. Any other nominations? Yes, Mr. President. I would like to nominate Mr. Mitchell. And I know that um, uh, through our plans, um, he's my he's my older brother, Koshinaga Shinika. I call him by my brother, and you know he he doesn't really. I know he would be an awesome um, president. Um, he's been a vice president under uh, my term, under um, the former president before me, Mr. Titus, and I just know that he would also do a phenomenal job for our students. Um, and I know that he has been um, a board member for several years, and he's got that experience under his belt. And I know that just attending different events with him, um, he's very active within his community. He's very active here in the Gallup area. He knows a lot of people. They're always coming up to him and telling him such a great job he's doing, but then he'll and, and he'll introduce me because not that many people know me in the in the Gallup area, but he's, he knows a lot of people and I think his reputation within his own district and with the Gallup area speaks for himself. And I know that him being a vice president for a few years now, he would make a phenomenal president. And I, I know that he doesn't give himself credit sometimes, but he is excellent in um, excelling as one of our leaders within our schools and I just want to I just really want him to use this as an encouragement too that um, time to move up brother um, and I hope that you accept the nomination and I hope that um, our other board members here realize that you know you are very valuable within our district too so I can't have any other nominations? Not that I want to entertain a motion. 
Mr. President, a motion to close nominations? A motion has been made to close nominations. Roll call, Joe. Mr. Shaw? Yes. Mr. Mortensen? Yes. Ms. Magnolito? Yes. Mr. Mitchell? Yes. Mr. Long? Yes. Okay. I guess we'll have the, um, the voting right now. And we'll do the voting in the order of the nominations. I guess my be the first one up for the votes election. Call them. For Charles Long, Mr. Shaw. Yes. Mr. Mortensen. Yes. Ms. Magnolito. No. Mr. Mitchell? No. Mr. Long? Yes. Okay. We uh, elected or re elected the president. Myself will continue as president of the school board. Now I'd like to open nominations for the vice president. Mr. President, I would like to nominate Chris Mortensen for Vice President. Okay. Any other nominations? Yes, I would like to nominate Mr. Mitchell. Okay. Other nominations? At this time, I'd like to close the nominations. Okay. Nomination. Motions are made to close nominations. Zero call, John. Mr. Shaw? Yes. Mr. Morrison? Yes. Ms. Manuelito? Yes. Mr. Mitchell? Yes. Mr. Wong? Yes. Okay, let's uh, do the voting. Chris Morrison. Those voting for Chris Morrison. Roll call. Chris Morrison. Mr. Shaw? Yes. Mr. Morrison? Yes. Ms. Manuelito? No. Mr. Mitchell? No. Mr. Wong? Yes. Okay, thank you, board members. We do have a new vice president, Chris Morrison. Now we do nominations for the secretary. Then open up uh, nominations for the secretary. Mr. President, I'd like to nominate uh, Mr. Shaw. For secretary. Okay. Any other nominations? I would nominate Mr. Mankito. Okay. Any other nominations? I make a motion to close nominations. Okay. Nominations for secretary are now closed. Uh, let's do the voting now. First for. Uh, Roll call for closing nominations. Yeah, okay. Mr. Shaw? Yes. Mr. Morrison? Yes. Mrs. Magdalena? Yes. Everybody, the board members, for your participation in uh, having new officers elected.
Honorable Board of the members of the board members, excuse me. I invite Dr. Wyda, also she is a guest, uh, to give more information on this action item, and then we'll open up for questions. Thank you, Mr. President. I'll fire you I want to introduce Ms. Frieda Nagel. She's been the primary contact for the survey. So, and I know you have the copy of some of the uh, questions on the survey given to you. So, if you have any questions, Ms. Nagel is here to answer them. Good evening, um, the board, president, vice president, secretary, and um, the board here in the audience. My name is Frida Nagel. I'm with the Medical Health Education Program, and I'm the um, sort of like a liaison to um, with this uh, Youthers Behavior Survey, and um, giving you all um, everything in a packet is there, the overview, and then also the um, the survey, the results of the survey, the trend, the consent, um, parental consent. In the high school and middle school um, questionnaire, they're all there. Um, I'm just uh, hoping that maybe you got a chance to review some of that. If you have any questions, here and representing to um, uh, to start this um, the new uh, the school year, beginning um, the fall, before we start doing our survey again, and then we'll do this two-year survey. And um, we do this every three years. So this year is a, a year that we're going to be doing. I'll be the one that have come, the contact person, and go to all the schools and start um, administering in the fall. So um, just on behalf of the, the Navajo Nation um, here, representing you. Questions, comments, board members? Um, as, you know, after the survey is done, um, you say you do this every three years? Okay. Okay. So the last one you did was when? 2014, but uh, you, you saw that one that was um, unweighted. Did we? That meaning that... Um, I don't recall seeing the results or anything, any uh, feedback. Yeah, there was um, six specific school, each school that participate, there was a report, which we don't, we know, we don't see, but it goes straight to the school, so I'm pretty sure um, I've given that all to the superintendent, so I think um, it's around. <laughs> okay. okay. I, I wanted to know, um, how does this benefit the Napa Nation and also, um, our school district. Um, what what happens to re the results? Is it put in a database? Is it um, who is it presented to? And how does this? You know, is it for awareness? Um, you know, um, on the first on the uh, the overview, it pretty much explains all that. Your questions and how the purpose of it, and also the, what the procedure. So, Mr. Hyatt or Coletta, um, do we use these um, survey results within our district for any funding or any other additional information to our district? Thank you for that question, Ms. Manuel, to members of the board. I got a copy of the survey results from 2014, a month or so ago, and Ms. Linda, our counseling coordinator, and I are looking through the data right now, and I can provide a, 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 a copy for the next board meeting as far as the uh, results from those by school. And then what we're doing between Ms. Linda, Mar and I is looking at where which schools need what type of support. For example, if there's a school that really has a substance abuse issues, we're gonna get, we're gonna put in more resources and more help and support for students at that school. 
So we're looking at that data now. So I can give that data to at the next meeting. Okay. And I, I think it kind of uh, it's kind of upsetting to know that we we've been getting these results I see from 2005, and you know with the trend that's happening, it's nice to know that like tobacco use and alcohol use is going down. But you know I, I mean but there should have been. I mean, that's why I'm asking, were these data used to benefit Galvin County, our district, to help our children? Um, I work a lot with suicide prevention, and, you know, to have this kind of information is valuable. Um, and exactly what you said, so you guys can see what's happening out there emotionally, physically, um, and the wellness of our children, not so much academics, but also their health. And this kind of data should really provide an insight for us to take some action. And if we're barely doing that now, you know, what was done previous, previously, um, and, and just glancing at this, the, the results quickly, um, you know, I'm glad to see that suicide has really has really started to decrease. So. President Long, uh, Ms. Langlito, if I could just add, and there's some data that we have received in the past that we can't speak to per se because uh, we're, we're, we're newer to the district or uh, back in the district with respect to being overseeing these uh, this kind of data. But we also have received, will receive. Risk and Resiliency Survey data from the state of New Mexico, which are some similarities. But I think that's one of the things that we need to become better at is, and that we're committed to, is utilizing this data to one, as in Dr. White stated, to focus our efforts in those areas of need, especially the school site. But it also offers us some overall trends in the district, and if there's any overall initiatives that we need to enact. So while I can't speak to the, the past, per se, in this particular area, that is one of our areas of commitment to make sure that we're taking care of the whole child's needs, uh, which is obviously academic, but also the emotional and physical welfare of our students as much as we possibly can. So, Dr. White wants to add any more to that. What we have done in the counseling area is do like a one size fits all kind of model. We've been doing support as far as violence, bullying tobacco use, alcohol, those kind of things, and more or less a one-size-fits-all type of model. But now that we have this data, we're going to be looking at more specific, I know their schools, they have more needs in certain areas versus other areas, so we're going to be looking at that and putting in more resources into those schools. More personalized. If this is, I mean, if this is truly important information and the survey results are important, then I mean, it makes sense that this type of survey would, should include all students. And if it's really that important, it should include all students. Is there a way to make it all encompassing or anything? Or how, what can we do with that? The, sir, the what you're approving are just for the Gallup Indian Medical Center service area. As you notice, the Navajo schools are now on there They're because they're served under the Fort Defiance area. So, most likely they're going to be coming forward with their, their part as well to um, survey those students. Does our school district have a mechanism to survey non-NAVO students? Yes, and that's what I refer to the Youth Risk and Resiliency Survey. That's for all students produced and distributed by us through the state of Mexico. Uh, and it, it encompasses everybody. Sure, great. The more data, the better, in my opinion. It seems valuable. I mean, I think it makes sense to collect this data and take action on it for everybody, not just the Navajo students. Yes, I agree. And and are they going to be working in collaboration with our wellness committee that we have? Will they be getting this? I know that's something that um, Mr. Hinneman used to work real hard with when we had a board member that was on that wellness committee. And I think this is some valuable information that they would need to review and look at. So I hope they work in conjunction with each other um, on this, and the last question I have is, um, what percentage um, do the parents give their consent? They, um, 
what happened was that that's why it was um, unweighted because uh, some parents did it because we, we went active on um, consent and I think we're going on passive consent to where all the students were. So um, some school they um, chose active so the parents um, didn't want their kids to. And I don't know how much percent of that that um, participate. So the um, the third, the third bullet or the third sheet pretty much kind of tells you how much percent that the students participate in these schools. With that, Mr. President, I would like to motion for approval, but also um, stress the concern of our our board um, um, vice president, uh, Mr. Mortensen. Uh, his concern about uh, doing across the board the survey for everybody. Thank you. Okay, motion has been made to approve the survey. Roll call, gentlemen. Mr. Shaw? Yes. Mr. Martinson? Yes. Ms. Magdalena? Yes. Mr. Mitchell? Yes. Mr. Long? Yes. Thank you, board. Oh, no, okay. Okay, yes. Thank you. Let's go to item C. This is an agreement between the school district and the Crown Point uh, Hospital and then health services. Again, I invite Dr. White with any guests that she has for this particular action item.
And, you know, I know that we have parents that are in that situation. I know it does not affect a lot of the inner city schools or, or parents within the Gallup area, but it's a struggle for our parents in the county area and the outskirts areas. And, you know, if you're retired and you don't have, you know, a job,
that 30 minutes doesn't matter to me one way or the other, but certainly I can sympathize. I mean, for me to get done with work and get out to Twin Lakes Elementary at 4 p.m. is, is tough, and so I could see how vice versa might be might be true as well. I, uh, I have, you know, for discussion sake, I have no problems moving it back to six. That doesn't bother me at all. And, and that was one thing that I was going to bring up, and I, I, I didn't, was, you know, even the meetings out there, you know, we, if, if, you, if you were, if, when you saw when we were out at Navajo, you know, we started at um, our early time, but then towards the end, we saw more and more parents coming in after they got off work. And, you know, I, I wondered the same thing too, you know, I don't know why we have that at four, I know there's times when we have to travel, um, but I think that you know we still have to keep in mind our parents. And but that is a good point, Mr. President. I would like to say that I, I agree with both um, Mr. Lawrence and, and Ms. Manuelito on the time. You know I really feel that six o'clock um, has been a good time for all, and you know we do have to worry about the safety of our parents and. And making sure that you know they are able to attend our meetings um, in order to voice their concerns if they need to, or just to be present at our meetings um, to sit and listen in to um, the ongoings of our district. So I, I would, you know, would also like to see the change, the time change back to 5:30 to 6, and then even looking into changing our out of town meetings um, to 6 o'clock as well. Is there a, Mr. President, is there a, a board policy or something that that, uh, that talks about what time they're supposed to be at, or is it just board preference? I think it's pretty much board preference. Okay. That's the way it's going. If it, I mean, if it, if it brings more parents and students out to our board meetings to participate, then I, I'm in favor of doing the six. If, if it's that, if, I mean, if, if that will bring more people out, then let's do it. Mr. President, with that, I would like to make a motion to move, um, to change our OMA um, to 6 o'clock for the, for all board meetings. Okay, uh, before we take a roll call, uh, let me give uh, my comments. I think, you know, this is a, a very tough issue. You know, one side you have uh, parents, their safety needs to be concerned or be considered, but also the staff. You know, they're humans too. And I think uh, the reason why we said 5.30 was, uh, you know, there were marathon sessions held by the school board and no consideration for parents were made at that time. And I think this is something that, that uh, needs to be really thought out. So with that, you know, a roll call motion has been made to move the meetings back to six. I think, Mr. President, just in comment to that, I, you know, I think if we were going till 10, 11 o'clock at night, I wouldn't mind moving it up 30 minutes, but it seems like our meetings have have been efficient and moved along, and so I, I mean, I think it, I think it makes sense. Uh, Mr. President, I think that, you know, when we did have our marathon meetings, I think the, the issues and everything that on the agenda, they were very important and needed attention at those times. Therefore, you know, yes, we did have long meetings, but, you know, I think that anything, the outcomes of those long meetings were something that needed to happen. And therefore, you know, Yes, we do have long meetings at some time, but you know, we, that's what we're here for. I think um, a lot of times, you know, you have to think about the issues that are being considered. Yes, some are important, um, but I think when I became president of the board, um, I said to myself, you know, a lot of things on the agenda, board agenda, this could be done in two hours. That is why our meetings have uh, not gone beyond that prison. So, roll call, motion's been made to move the meeting 
regular meetings back up to six o'clock. This includes the meeting here, the meetings here at the boardroom, and when we go out to communities. Mr. Shaw? No. Mr. Mortensen? Yes. Ms. Magnolita? Yes. Mr. Mitchell? Yes. Mr. Hall? No. So with that, I guess our meetings go back up to six. Thank you, board members. You can have. Okay, let's go down to item E. President Long, members of the board, uh, we, last year, as you know, our audit, uh, you know, took a while. It came in late, and we did it towards the end of the year. Uh, that was just due to the person that we contracted with, the time frame they could do it in. Well, this year, our con the person we're contracting with uh, would like to start like ASAP soon. And so we need an audit committee uh, this year to be a part of that process. And so I'm going to invite Joanna Hanks up just for a quick second to explain who's on that committee and then a little bit about the time frame of what that might look like for this year. President Long, members of the board, Superintendent Hyatt, um, the audit committee is statutorily required in the state of New Mexico. Um, I would like at least two board members on that committee. It will also include a financial member from the community, and, and that's just an individual who has previous accounting knowledge of some sort to be able to provide a constructive outside point of view, and then also a parent. Um, and as of tonight, I actually do have those two members. Um, I did have, I was actually just talking today about I wish I could get, and they came up and said I'll do it. So I'm very excited about that. So I do need two board members. Um, the meetings are not very long. It does include an entrance and, of course, monitoring of the external contractor that we have coming into the district to do our external audit. Um, and then also an overview of the findings and issues and concerns of the exit conference prior to the release by the state auditor. So I just to add, this would be kind of like elections. You can nominate and then you approve if you want to do it that way. Or you can just volunteer. You're really excited about it. Just yeah, your hands are flying up, I can see. <laughs> yeah, two, two individual board members. I, I think Chris would make um, be good at on the audit committee. I'll do it if the audit committee can match my uh, salary. And match my board meet member salary. Zero dollars, you got it. Okay, no problem. I'd be happy. Another member? Hey, Priscilla with me. She's been attending a lot of the budget sessions and trainings. Well, I think um, I would really like the other newer board members I've been serving on this committee. Oh, Two years, maybe two years with Mr. Benini, and um, you know I, I would really would like to see the other newer um, board members. It, it's it's a lot of information, but very valuable. Um, but if they have other obligations, then you know I don't mind. But I would rather them um, learn more about the audit. I would be willing to serve. Okay. Thank you. You have your two members, Giovanna. You'll keep us posted when the meetings are or whatever. I'll be sending out dates for the entrance conference and availability in the next few weeks. Sounds very exciting. It is. It's very exciting. <laughs> <Appreciate it. laughs> so, with that, uh, we concluded our business for members. I make the motion we adjourn. Motion's been made. By Michael to adjourn. Roll call. Don't. Michael Shaw? Yes. Hold on. I would just like to request um, the next uh, meeting um, that we have an executive session put on the for updates on our um, legal services, please. I think it might make sense on those executive sessions in an effort to keep these meetings brief if there is any way possible that the board could meet 
separately from the actual school board meeting? Is that possible for an executive session? Mr. Mortensen, uh, President Long, that is an option. And so I just want to clarify what you're asking for. You're asking for uh, a discussion about legal items or legal uh, lawsuits or legal matters, or are you talking about legal contract services? Yeah. To, I, I didn't know quite what we were trying to refer to. I, well, I think I was Mr. 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 question about her issue about wanting to have the executive session, and I'm fine with that. I'm asking, is it possible to have that? I understand we may not be able to take action on any items from the executive session if it's separate, but if it's possible to do that at a separate meeting, just out of respect to parents and staff members, so you know, try to keep these these meetings brief. Yes. Is that possible? The answer is yes. Uh, my, but my question goes back to Ms. Magnolito, is what specifically on that board agenda or that I ever used to discuss, wanting to best to discuss so I can make sure it's clearly laid out? Our legal standings of our lawsuits and... Okay, that's what I okay. All right, pending litigation. I'd also like to ask that on the next board agenda we talk further about our uh, school board strategic planning that we talked talk about, get that on the calendar. We all agree that it's fairly important with IT in that Thank you. I actually got an update today uh, from the person we were looking to use, and so I'll, I'll share that information. Yeah, the strategic plan is something that's very needed, and we're just pretty much waiting for our facility. Great. So, um, motion was made. I just want to mention one more thing, board members. Um, you know, we, we sit here and, you know, we have, I, I, I sometimes feel guilty um, about, you know, not really accommodating our guests and our parents that come out and sometimes sit um, with us a little bit longer than the time that we have now. And there's no water or coffee. And, you know, I feel really bad that, you know, we're drinking coffee, I kind of said this now, but we're drinking coffee, but we're not extending that um, to our guests. And, you know, we I've attended different board meetings in um, Central Consolidated, and uh, they have a lot of refreshments for their guests. And I think that um, as people that, you know, we should be more welcoming um, to our guests and our parents that attend uh, these board meetings and, you know, have a pot of coffee in the back um, for them, um, for them just to enjoy while we're here, um, while they're here attending the board meeting. And I'm sure that um, the fellow, our, my fellow board members up here, um, Chris could even bring some burritos that he keeps saying he brings bring us and we haven't received. I'll bring the energy drinks. <laughs> um, but I think if we all donate um, ourselves as board members um, back to our parents, I think that would be something that would be um, help bring just to be more friendlier and a lot more welcoming to our parents. Um, so if we could entertain that, Mr. Hyatt, and um, Mr. President, if you guys could initiate that, I would really appreciate that. Mrs. Manuelito, we discussed that today, and although we were trying to boost our vending machine sales, no, I'm just kidding. Uh, that was a great suggestion. We actually discussed that in our executive leadership team meeting today, and plan to do that for the board meeting, for like finger food and uh, refreshments for all board meetings from here on out. So thank you for the suggestion. So once again, motion has been made to adjourn the meeting. Roll call, John. Mr. Shaw? Yes. Mr. Mortensen? Yes. Ms. Manuelito? Yes. Mr. Mitchell? Yes. Mr. Long? Yes. 721. Okay. Meeting adjourned at 721. Thank you, board members, and those in attendance. Yeah, I'm so high. Thank <laughs> you.